Small Town Tales podcast is produced by 22 Creations Multimedia, LLC. This is the show where you'll hear paranormal tales, haunting legends, and spiritual insights about the metaphysical world. Explore the paranormal through small town lore with experts and guests from all walks of life. Welcome to Small Town Tales Podcast with C.L. Thomas. Welcome to the first episode of Small Town Tales of 2023. I'm your host, C.L. Thomas. Small Town Tales is now in its third season. It's really tough to believe that. Looking back at how the show has grown over the last two years really makes me reflect on how I've grown as a person. This show has been giving a platform to aspiring writers and paranormal investigators who may not otherwise get the traction that some of these more prominent artists and celebrities have. One of the biggest questions I've gotten over the last week is, Who were my favorite guests over the past year? I don't like to label them as favorites because they all have touched me in some way and challenged how I look at the paranormal. I've had so many good guests, but I'd have to say one of my one of my most intriguing interviews was with medium Scott Allen, who was just genuine and kind. There was a lot of connection off radio that happened, and he has become a really good friend, and I really respect him. Not to mention his story of working in a funeral parlor as a medium is just mind blowing. Just think about that. You're a medium and you work in a funeral parlor. Another one would have to be Tim Dennis from Darkness Radio. This talented radio host stepped out of the shadows on radio just recently, and he just blows me away because he's so good at what he does. The searchers, Josh Purvis and Shane Pittman, are probably another favorite because of their work is so honest. Uh, Recently, I talked to a husband and wife team, Beyond the Veil. And their story is probably the most touching. I couldn't imagine having a haunting in the house affecting my child, a baby nonetheless. I think that would have been really hard to overcome, and I just really value what they do. For 2023, I plan to continue to small town and develop it as a radio show. I know everyone is streaming videos these days, and I've been asked to do live videos. Maybe in the future I can do this when time allows for me personally. Right now, I just don't have the time, guys. I'm sorry. Um, It may come soon, but not right now, not within the next six months. I have a lot going on in the new year, and I look forward to seeing what, what everyone else is developing in the paranormal field. I do plan on attending some paranormal conventions and meeting new friends. I'll let you guys know where I will be. My guest for tonight is paranormal researcher and thinker who is changing the way we think about spirit communication through the experimentation of sensory perception deprivation. Mike has appeared on many paranormal podcasts and several television spots. You may have seen him as the co-host of the War Party Paranormal Radio Show, hosted by KGRA Digital Broadcasting. Mike, thank you. Welcome to the show. Hey, happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Before we get into the geek side of paranormal, why don't you tell us about how you got started in the paranormal? Sure. Um, I would say like a lot of investigators um, that that are investigators now, like I, I did have a, an experience when I was when I was younger and I always kind of look back at it like, hmm, I wonder if I was just dreaming or, you know, or maybe I was thinking, you know, because it was so long ago. So you start to like fabricate things, you know. Um, but then I, I was always fascinated by all things paranormal and conspiracy theories, paranormal stuff, UFOs, cryptids. But I was always like very skeptical. I just enjoyed like, you know, researching it, looking into it and trying to see if I could find any evidence. And it always um, was very passionate about it until um, I would say like about nine years ago, I was at a friend's house and his wife was there with her friend and her friend started telling us that she thought her house or apartment might be haunted. So we actually went over there when she was out of town did a little bit of investigation and we came across some some unbelievable stuff and like i i walked in and i heard water running and i was like water what the heck nobody's there but the dog little dog and so i walked over to the bathroom and i opened the door because the door was shut 
and all her women's like product and everything that was on the counter was pushed into the sink and uh, both the hot and the cold water spigot were turned on. So I was like, what in the world? And it was closed from the inside. Like somebody had to pull it shut. So it wasn't like the dog pushed it by accident shut. Somebody had to pull and shut that. And, and the owner of the apartment was, was out of town and we were the only ones with the key. So it was very strange. Um, <clears throat> We actually did capture an EVP. We heard a growl. And the strangest thing was when we walk, walked outside to smoke a cigarette, it was me and my buddy. And we came back inside. The dog, you know, it only had like three, four inch legs. It was like a little thing was on top of the kitchen counter. And it blew my mind. I could not figure out what was going on. And, and being that it was like one of my first investigations to experience all this, just you know, you just get hooked right in, you know? And then ever since that, I was, uh, you know, investigating on my own here and there. And then once I went, met War Party, you know, and we started doing events and this and that, like I, I'm almost investigating almost every week. So this team is a big part of your paranormal journey. How did you guys come up with War Party? Paranormal? Where does that come from? So the, uh, the co-founders, the, the one main, uh, of the co-founders, uh, Zap Adderall, but we call him Zap. His real name's John. He likes to tinker and stuff like I do with electronics, real techie guy. So we call him Zap and, uh, he is part Native American. So if you see the War Party logo, it's, uh, got the whole headdress on. It's a skull. And that actually is a patch from the military, the Air Force. Um, and he's like a military type guy. So it just kind of worked out and they call him Chief Whooping Ass. <laughs> but that's what the logo is. And, and he, we're, he's from Florida and he's part Native American. So it just kind of fit. And what he explains it as is that we're always in, in a battle, you know, with everything, not, not only, uh, with sometimes with things paranormal and dark, but you also have to like, you know, they're like, Oh, what do you do? You know, you're an investor, paranormal investigator, go center. Oh, come on. You know, that's crazy. You know, so we're always in some kind of a battle. Like, you know, no, we're helping people and that's what we do. And then we help people. Uh, doing by doing residentials and different things. And we, we host events to raise money for the historical societies and that kind of thing. So that's kind of how that happened. Um, and then being that we host a bunch of events and different things, we need a lot of, uh, a lot of people on the team. So over the years, we, you know, went through a lot of different people, but now we got a really tight fit family and we're, we're a large team and we actually have a North division and a South division all one team. We all do, you know, work together. But if there's a residential that comes up in the more Southern part, then, you know, the South team will take it. If something's up North, the, the North team will take it. Do you guys have it all broken down? I was curious about that because there's a team out of Arizona that is really big like that too. And another person that I know asked them, well, how do you guys all investigate one case with that many people? So we don't, we handpick a few out of the group you know so we'll say like you know obviously the founders are going to be there and then they'll they'll grab um a couple of the investigators and then we also have a uh, psychic medium on the team so it's usually only a couple people for the investigation the residentials um but we have a, a, a eclectic group of people you know we have historians on the team we have psychic mediums. We have spiritual people that, uh, you know, that can do cleansings and different things. We, ha we have all types of different people on the team and they all do their own part. Um, so yeah, it works really, really well. And they got it down to a science, you know, it's definitely, yeah, we definitely don't all like go to somebody's house, like 30 of us show up like, Hey, we're here. That's why they call us war party, ready to party <laughs> now. So we, we, you know, like I said, we will grab a couple of select people and then we'll kind of rotate through guys find your people if you don't mind me asking so that's the whole reason that we do events um you know we host ghost hunting events where people can come out and they pay it for a ticket and what we do is it's not like a tour it's an actual ghost hunting event like we'll do evps with everybody there we'll do different things we'll have equipment set up we'll talk about the equipment what we do um and we'll try to capture some evidence and you know, basically to spread awareness and let people know that we're out there 
and they get comfortable with us, seeing us in person, meeting us. And then, you know, every once in a while, somebody might come to a couple of events. We'll see the same person. And then they might be like, hey, uh, you have a minute? Like, oh, you're going to think I'm crazy, but this, you know, I was like, no, trust me. You know, some of the stuff I've seen and heard, uh, I'm not going to think you're crazy. Don't worry. So that's kind of why we started doing the events to get our name out there, bring awareness and let people know what we do. And then that kind of turned into the show that we do. People, you know, we're starting to build a following. Um, and we've got asked to do a lot of different type of events and, you know, and, and there you have it. Florida is one of those really magical states. It's one of my favorite states. I got to spend a lot of time there. It seems like every pocket of Florida, no matter where you go, has a crazy haunting. It's true. There, There's a lot here and a lot of people miss, you know, overlook that. You know, they when they think about Florida, the first thing they don't, they don't think about is, oh, there's a lot of history and haunted stuff there, you know, yeah. um, like like you do in some of the northern states. Right. So the problem with that is, is, you know, the, the land is so valuable here that if something becomes abandoned or if it's old and historic and they don't like the way it looks, it's coming down, right. you know, and they're going to build a condo there. Um, so it's tough to, you know, that's why we're, we're so dedicated about saving these historic places and helping raise money for them as well. But yeah, there is a lot of stuff going on, a lot of UFOs, a lot of skunk ape sightings, uh, hauntings and stuff. And, you know, definitely with, St. Augustine, you have what's the oldest city in the United States from the Spanish, and then you have uh, Key West, you know, which is the Island of Bones, right? And then so much Native American stuff. It's everywhere. It's so, and it's it's crazy because a lot, you know, you can't build, obviously, so what they do is they turn them into parks, and they don't even, like, let you know. Like, there might be a small little plaque somewhere but it looks like a regular park and you see like a little hill over there. Well, yeah, that hill's an ancient burial mound. Um, and then a lot of times what happens too, cause talking to some people in construction and different things, if they find like any human remains or, or anything, um, you know, dating back to the native American times, uh, they will, they will have to shut it down and turn it into an archeological site. So a lot of times the construction workers will be like, oh, pull out a tooth, like out of the, and be like, oh, I don't see anything, you know, like, and then just keep doing their thing. So it, it's just everywhere. Plus, in a lot of the places, right, you know, water is a conduit. Um, you know, you have uh, limestone everywhere, which which is a conductor. And then, you know, going into the theory that that the whole spiritual world is all energy. And all the stuff you have, those, you know, all the water, the limestone, the things, and then you have all the ancient stuff that's going on on top of a building or property that is is having a haunting. So it just amplifies things, I think. One of the experiences I had when I was there uh, was in Pensacola, of all places. You wouldn't think Pensacola was haunted, but it really is. If you look into it, there's almost something in every town, every city, or a couple things. Like Miami has a lot of stuff. Um, you know, all over, all over, even here where I live, um, I'm in like a small town, Boca, which is like right on the Broward and North and West Palm beach border. And it's a small little city, but even our, uh, historical, um, sorry, it's, it's now the town hall, but it used to be like an historical building. It is a historical building and they supposedly have haunted things uh, going on there. I have never been there. Um, to that location, but yeah, there's stuff everywhere. Even FAU is supposed to be haunted. The the college. So interesting. So let's get into the tech side. What are some of the equipment that you guys like to use? Without going, don't go into the methods just yet. We'll get into yeah, that. Yeah, just like the equipment itself. Yeah. So being that we're you know like I said a big team and we we host events, so we have to uh, have stuff for for uh, you know the guests to see and and talk about so we we probably pretty much have everything <laughs> you name it um but i would say our go-to's you know millimeters and rem pods and things like that portals spirit box but we use a lot of dr60s i don't know if you're familiar with those or older recorders um that are very kind of controversial like some people love them or they hate them kind of thing but we get so many 
class A EVPs off these devices, I would say that's our most used thing is, is recorders. Um, we do use all types of recorders from older to, to more modern. Um, but I feel like some of the older recorders actually capture EVPs a little bit better than some of the newer ones. It's because of the frequency is different on the older versions. Yeah, it, it, there, I think there's a couple things that, that weigh into it, you know. The new condenser microphones and everything, they're built to uh, suppress, you know, noise and, and things of that nature. You know, the other ones are just rude and crude and just record, you know what I mean? They pick up a lot more, um, mm -hmm. different things like that. But yeah, no, for sure. And and like I said, we, we try everything. So, um, you know, we like to experiment as well and do different types of experiments, different things. Uh, so, yeah, we're very innovative. I cannot wait to get into uh, the different methods that you guys use. So let's dive right into this. The experimental methods that all, impairment, all paranormal investigators out there like to discuss. You're known for the Delco experiment, which we'll get to that. There are three specific methods I would like to discuss. That's the methods. That's the Estes method, the Gainesfield method, and the Delco experiment. Can you Absolutely. talk first about what the Estes method is and how it works? Sure. So anybody out there that's listening, you know, I'm, I'm sure you've seen uh, or come across it somewhere along the lines of investigators with a blindfold on and headphones. And first, you have to understand the, the spirit box, right? So the spirit box is a AM or FM uh, radio without the tuner in it. So it basically just sweeps. The channels. Remember, like in your old uh, car, we used to turn the knob on your radio and you go. Ch -ch -ch -ch. So that's that's what you're hearing. A lot of you might already know this, um, but basically, you wear a pair of headphones, isolation headphones, and that's very important. I see a lot of people out there doing it with with just regular headphones, and that's not really the proper way. You want to noise isolation headphones, like drummers headphones. So even when they're not on, you can't hear anything around you. They're earmuffed almost, right? So you're listening to the spirit box. You got the headphones on. You can't hear anything else. Now you want to block the vision with a blindfold or a bandana, something like that. So you can't see. So now the only thing you're doing is focusing on what's coming through the spirit box. And the deal is you're supposed to shout out what you hear and what you feel. And somebody else is going to ask questions. So you have the transmitter. Um, you know, the person asking the questions and then you have the receiver, the person that's going to be listening and repeating what they hear. And the reason that you want to blindfold the person is so they can't read your lips um, or, you know, try to tell what's going on or anything like that. They just need to be focused on the spirit box. And doing that method, we have, have a lot of people have come across some like really surprising, amazing results. And, and so have we, um, and, you know, it, it takes a lot of the, I would say, you know, interference out. You know, if, if somebody is is listening to a spirit box and you're not blindfolded and you're listening, you know, subconsciously, not that the person is lying or faking or making up things, but subconsciously you see the question, you, you kind of like you see them ask it something, you know, you know, you might spit out something that's not 100 percent. Uh, you know, it's not 100 percent because, you know, doing this method, it it's really isolation. So. The other method that you were asking about was the Gansfeld experiment, right? And it's similar but different, right? So this experiment was done, you know, back during like the Cold War days when okay, there was. Older. What's that? It's much older. Yeah, but that really, it, it, you know, it definitely goes goes even farther. But it's it's yeah, it was when they were doing all the the ESP uh, experiments and the government was trying to test uh, remote viewing and all these different things. So this is what, you know, somebody smarter than me kind of came up with this, this method. And what they would do is they would take ping pong balls and cut them in half and they would place them over your eyes with like uh, medical tape and seal everything up. So all you could see is the diffused white of the inside of the ping pong balls. And they would shine a red light at that. So now, all you see is red. You know, there's, you can't tell where it starts. You can't tell where it stops. You're just seeing red over your eyes and you're using headphones to listen to white noise. So now it's full sensory deprivation. Um, you can't hear and you can't see. And you're usually, you know, laying down, relaxed. And then they would ask you and pull flashcards 
and ask, you know, what kind of shape is this and different things to test ESP. Um, it was never proven. It was never, it was just an experiment, right? And then people were starting to hallucinate and see visions and see things. And um, so they called the Gansfeld effect, sorry, Gansfeld effect. And so I got to thinking one day, you know, I'm always tinkering around and doing stuff. And I mean, I said, man, that would, that would really be cool to do in a haunted location, right? But maybe we switch out the white noise to a spirit box. You know, so we can kind of mix the two methods together. And I don't think this has ever been done. And let's try it. See what happens. So I went on a mission trying to find a way to give you the red light effect without having to carry ping pong balls, a red lamp and tape and all this stuff into a haunted location. Um, So I started developing different pairs of goggles and glasses and different things. And I had like a whole box full of junk until I finally got it dialed in. You know, so now I I have like these steampunk welder type goggles that I designed with. Yeah, right. So not only do they work really well, you look kind of awesome. And it's got like a red um, electroluminescent panel in it. So it's ran off batteries and they're real small, compact. So you could throw these on and then you, you slap the headphones on and you basically do the assist method. But instead of the blindfold, you have the the full red. Uh, light sensory deprivation and right off the rip our first our first session we did was in the riddle house attic where the last team to investigate there was uh ghost adventures in 2008 and then ever since that they they locked the attic never let anybody in there we do events there they finally let us into the attic and we did the and we did the method there can you tell the can you tell our listeners what that place is for those who might yeah. have seen that? Yeah, so the the Riddle House is very became famous after it was on Ghost Adventures, you know. Um but it's in it's an old uh morgue and cemetery keepers home that was set east, you know, more towards the beaches and it's a historical home. Can't remember the date, but it was the uh, early 1900s. And there was a gentleman, Joe, which was the caretaker for the cemetery that lived there. And the owners accused him of stealing money. And he denied it to, you know, up and down. He said he wouldn't do that. He was very hurt by the, by them, you know, accusing him of this. And he ended up taking his own life eventually in the attic by Hank. So then they started experiencing you know, after the yesteryear village restored and saved the home and moved it out to their property. Um, they started getting a lot of reports of paranormal happenings uh, by the staff, by the security guards, by people, guests that were coming to visit during the day and just see the home and not even knowing the history. There's actually another spirit that supposedly resides there uh, called Mary. And they believe that she came in on one of the objects that was brought in. They brought in, uh, you know, obviously antiques into the home after they restored it to make it look more original. And they believe that something that came in brought this uh, spirit in the kitchen and she stays in, you know, in the kitchen area on the first floor. Also, if that's not enough, there was a young boy that uh, fell out of the second story window. And, and was killed. And supposedly people see him. So there's three main spirits there, so supposedly. Um, but we have captured some evidence, a lot of evidence, because we do events there. So we spend a lot of time there. And what we get paid is we don't, we don't take any of the money. The money goes to back to the historical society. The way that we get paid is they say, all right, we'll give you guys a night to yourselves. And so then we'll have a couple of the members that, that volunteer their time come out and we'll investigate. And that place is awesome. There's so many buildings in there that we could all split up and never see each other. Uh, there's a, and that's in the real house is not the only haunted building in, in the Astria village. The whole place has a history and, uh, you know, it's own each individual building. It's, it's crazy. It's there. I could go on all night just about this vill, vill, village, but. 
<laughs> yeah, it's called Yesteryear Village. It's at the South Florida Fairgrounds. And it's basically what it is, is it's a history, a living history park is what they call it. So they, they saved a lot of buildings from all over Florida and moved them to this park and restored them. And then during the day, they have, uh, you know, actors dressed in, in 1920s attire and and doing, you know, each one. There's a general store. There's a school. And, and they have all these people that work there and they put on like day events and you can go there. And Plus they walk you through and it's like living history which, museum. Yeah, yeah, exactly. They, that's what they call it, like a living history park. So we, we come in at night and we go through and investigate the buildings and uh, like a, kind of going back to the real house, because that's where we did the, the Delco experiment the first time. Um, we got, we got so many responses that I, I can't really remember them all off the top of my head, but there was, it was wild. It was wild. Like just the, the things that were asked and the responses that were said and Joe started seeing stuff. Um, and he was describing seeing like a pyramid with like the all seeing eye in the middle. And like, he, then at one point he felt like he was going down a hallway with lights, like almost like a hospital style hallway. Like he was getting dragged down it and he was explaining all this. Um, he felt something touching his neck. We, I mean, and, and during the Estes method, once and it's, Joe's a sensitive as all as well, you know, and he's a real good personal friend of mine. And I'm very skeptical at, you know, with certain stuff like that, because it's hard for me to understand it. If I've never experienced it, like, you know what I mean? Like, how are you seeing, like, you know what I mean? Like, how can you feel? So it's hard for me to tell because I'm not, I am very like blocked off and more of a techie kind of guy. Um, but yeah, no, he, he's legit, man. Anything that he's ever said or done and he's hesitant to say stuff too, you know, he'll be like, oh, you know, sounds weird, but, and, and some of the stuff that he was feeling, seeing and everything, it all just lined up. And I actually have some of those videos, like the first Delco, I have the full raw on cut raw version. Cause I actually put, I did like a TikTok live during it. Um, so I uploaded that whole video to my YouTube and then I have like a cut version of it as well. So it's not long and boring to some parts, you know, but I think one of the surprising things I said was like, Joe started getting like giggly, like giggling, like, ha ah, here, like laughing. And then like, Oh, you know, and, and I said, is this a child? And I didn't know about Jacob at the time. Uh, Eric, the team leader. And this is the boy that got fell out of the window. Yeah. So I'm like, I feel like there's a kid, like we're talking to a kid. Is there a child here? And the response was, I want to fly. I'm like, you want to fly? And that's when Eric told me that he fell out of the second story window. And I was like, oh my God, what? Like, that's crazy. That is crazy. So we, we got to take a quick break. Um, when we come back, I'm going to definitely ask you about your results from this place and have you walk us through the actual Delco experiment that you did. Small Town Tales podcasts. We'll be right back. Hello. My name is Vladim Paler. I am one of the most ruthless and controversial medieval rulers, and you're listening to Small Town Tales Podcast. Now, for real, my name really is Vlad and most probably a descendant of my infamous ancestor, but I am an official tour guide here in Romania. Ever since childhood, I loved exploring new places and going off the beaten path. I like showing my friends my secret finds so we could enjoy them together. And this is why I started as an independent tour guide in Bucharest initially. After meeting many people with Romanian roots, wanted to visit their ancestral country, or were just fascinated with this intriguing culture we have here, I figured that more would like to explore this hidden gem of Europe, Romania. Soon I opened a niche tour agency called Romanian Thrills, uh, always aiming for authentic experiences, remarkable accommodations, engaging with locals all the time to keep their heritage alive, and diving into that neo-traditional reinterpreted food scene and cuisine. I believe that travel is one of the best forms of education and want to inspire everyone to have a meaningful and memorable trip. So keep the travel spirit alive and see you soon on the podcast. Small Town Tales podcast continues. And we're back. I'm talking with Michael E. Del Coro and he's talking about the Dalco experiment. Mike, welcome back to the show. So tell us, give us a walkthrough of the Delco experiment. 
at the Riddle House. Yeah, sure. So we basically we had uh, Joe, which is uh, one of the uh, our team members that is an investigator, and he is also an empath and a you know I call him sensitive. You know he can he can sense when there's there's stuff going on. He he can see some stuff. I, I he's a psychic medium, right? But he won't call himself that because he's not a hundred percent confident. And he's still learning and doing stuff. Um, but he is, and he's a real deal. And so we we said, you know what? Let's have Joe do it first because he's got some really surprising results doing the S method. So we go up into the attic um, where Joseph hung himself, and we set up a chair. Joe sat down the chair, put the goggles on for the first time, and we were streaming this live um, at the time, so it's all documented. And we he puts the headphones on, and we let him sit. You want to sit for about 15 minutes just listening to the, the noise of the radio and to, you know, staring into these red lights. And, you know, your eyes are open. You know, that's the other different thing about the SS method and, and the Delco experiment is your eyes are open. You're, you're looking into these lights. So you're, you're awake, you know, you're up, you're looking, you want to sit there for about 15 and 20 minutes and get into that met- mental state, like almost like a meditation, mm-hmm. right? Because you have the noise that's consistent in your ears, the consistency, the, the extreme sensory deprivation. And after about 15 to 20 minutes, uh, I told him I was going to tap him, like give him a little tap on the knee. And then go ahead and start repeating whatever you hear, see, or feel. So right off the bat, I tap him, and he's just blurting some stuff out here and there. And I'm sitting next to him, and I'm asking the questions. Um, so obviously, I'm like, who's here? Is there anybody here who wants to talk to me? Well, the first way I open up a session is always like, hello, my name's Mike. I don't mean you any disrespect. I don't mean you any harm. We're just here to communicate with you. And, you know, we feel that, uh, you could be open to us and we want to discuss, we want to talk to you. Is there anything that you want to say? And, you know, we kind of open up a session like that and we're kind of going through. And <clears throat> like I said, I, I can't remember every uh, specific thing without kind of going back, but a lot of the responses were coming back and lining, like lining up to the T uh, of some of the questions we asked. And it was just really mind blowing. And then what the crazy part is, is Joe started seeing different visuals and reporting those and he he saw like a pyramid and he felt like he was getting pulled down a hallway he was he saw a face right in front of him and we've got that report a couple times of people seeing images and seeing at one point he described like through his mind's eye seeing the room with like a glow from under his feet like almost like an out-of-body experience and um, I've had other people back that same claim up. I, I've done it myself, obviously, multiple times. I, I never really got many visuals. It depends on the person. Um, but we actually had Natalie, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, Natalie Jones, uh, the CEO of Paraflix, and uh, Patty Negri try it. And Patty... Is this at the same house? No, this was at a different location. Okay. Um, we yeah we gave them the the goggles to try and they used them and Eric was there and she had some really amazing responses as well. Um, but yeah, back at the Riddle House, um, we got uh, you know I thought that the, I was getting responses that seemed childish, and we were asking about uh, you know I said is there a child here is there a boy here, and um, yeah we got the name I'm sorry uh, then Eric kind of told me about about Jacob the little boy that fell out of the window. Um, we did a really long session and, you know, probably about uh, 30, 40 minutes. We don't like to go over that um, for safety reasons, you know, so you're, yeah. sensory deprivation and all. And, and especially if he's a sensitive guy and there's a lot of stuff going on, you know, we don't want to, we don't want to push it. So after that, um, we kind of debriefed and went downstairs and we're all talking about it. And it was just like, we were just blown away. Was there any significance that you found with the pyramid? I do you think that was- I, I, I don't I don't know I don't know Mm-mm. it's an no, earth. I, I I thought about it and I looked at stuff in the area and I, I just I couldn't I don't I don't I don't know and there's also that thing too is like um I forget what they call it exactly but if you're like a psychic medium that you, there's 
sometimes when you're in that state of mind, some of your your own personal stuff might come in mm -hmm. to play there too, you know? Also, it gives you like that little bit of a hallucinogenic effect. Uh, doing, it's like, uh, they also, there's a thing out there called uh, binaural beats. Have you, have yes. you ever heard of this? Yeah. Yeah. So you can use that. these goggles, you can use these goggles for that as well. Um, but yeah, no, I, I never did figure any significance to that. The hallway thing I thought maybe made me think of the morgue. You know, it used to be a morgue downstairs and a cemetery. You know, if you were being rolled on a cart into, you know, the area where they dress and, and do their thing, that that might look that way, you know, if you were. But I, the only other thing I actually, you know what? I did think of something that one of the team members brought up the all seeing eye with the pyramid. Mm hmm. It's on. It's on money. It's on the dollar bill. Yes, it is, and it's also. And he was. What's that? It's also an image of the Masons. Yeah, a Mason it? symbol as well. So, could that tie into it? You know, I didn't get that that deep into it to be honest with you, to find out if he, if they were Masons or or what. But um, yeah, definitely weird. There's a lot of symbolize symbolism behind that pyramid. So that's why I was asking if it was any. Yeah, no, there is. There's a lot. And it, it could be, there's so many different things that, that could tie into that. And I, I made like a logo for the Delco goggles and it's, it's like a, like a bearded skull, like with the headphones on. And it has like the all, the pyramid and the all seeing eye, like in the top of the skull, like just because I don't know, I just thought like it was the first time we ever did it. And I just would add that to it. It was pretty neat. So this experiment is catching on with a lot of investigators. It seems like it's really popular right now. Um, how did you, I guess you came up with this from just looking at Gainesfield, but what do you think makes this work? What do you think with binarial beats and hemi-sync and all these different things that get you into this meditative state? What is your theory on why this all works? You know, I think that the we're all born with that, with some type of extrasensory that uh, that we're not using as human beings to the fullest extent because it's been basically taught out of us. Um, and I think this type of work and frequency, you know, is everything. Right, everything is vibrations, and the brain responds to to frequencies and different things. And I think this helps your body get into your your physical form more connect with your spiritual form because you are almost forces of meditation on you right mm -hmm. it almost like somebody that you could probably get the same effect if you sat in a room and like stream meditated and then somebody came in and put those the headphones on you and told you to repeat you know what i mean like i, I feel like this just speeds that up and gets you into that frame of mind and that state where, you know, you, you start to, to, to tap in. And that's why I was like the Gansfeld experiment to me when I was like hallucinogenic effects, I'm wondering if those were related to the ESP, right? right. So maybe they weren't just random pictures or random images that the person was seeing. Maybe these were related to, um, what they were actually testing for that somebody smarter than me came up with the test for ESP and now they're seeing images, right? So that sounds to me like it's possibly working and not just hallucinogenic mainstream science blowing it off as like a hallucin you know, a hallucination. Um, so being that we're tying this into the, the paranormal field and, and basically parapsychology, right? And, and mixing it with, with standard ghost hunting techniques. Um, and people are seeing the results. You know, and that's why it's catching on. It, and it's very surprising uh, to me. And, and I'm like very flattered, you know, like we, I didn't name it the Delco. One of my co team members, Ernesto, he's on a, in a band. And I was like, what are we going to call these things, man? And he's like, I don't know. Call them the Delco goggles, man. Delco experiment. My last name's Del Coro. And I was like, all right, dude, sounds good to me. Let's do it. And, you know, other people obviously witness um, us doing it. And we're a big team. We have a big social media presence. And then, you know, other people are testing it and I wanted other people to do it. You know, sometimes, you know, that's a weird thing about this field is people, there's a lot of jealousy is a lot of, uh, different, um, yeah, it is. And, you know, I'm all about pair unity and, and everybody, you know, so I'm, I'm like, you know what? I want people to try it. I want to see the results. I want to, I want to see as, you know, basically looking at it as a scientific point of view, 
the more subjects that are doing it and the more data that we can collect uh, as a, as you know, a population, the better, right? Exactly. So being that these things are handmade and I'm making them here and I can only make so many, you know, with all the other things I'm doing, it's like, I got all this free time, <laughs> uh, you know, work and I still got to pay the bills. Right. So I'm just making them as I can. And, and, and I was raffling them off at, at different things and like giving people a chance to get them. And, um, I started making a pair, a few pairs and what's that? You decided those. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and, we we gave a couple away. We we uh, so I started putting a couple on eBay, um, and right off the rip, as soon as I put them on there, somebody bought them. Um, one guy told me he bought them not even for the pair, and almost died. He's been looking for a pair of Gansfeld goggles. That's interesting. Um, and you can't find them. Like I looked for them before I started to decide to build my own. Like there is nothing. Um. So yeah, yeah. No, I, I'm. I'm. And the one of the other teams I sent it to, they sent me clips and stuff of, of what was going on there, and it's just really cool and i was like i said i'm I'm very humbled by it but i'm very excited as well and and it's neat to see other people doing something that's your brainchild and, you know and it's it's very cool so do you think this will change the way people investigate overall i i think yes uh in a way i think sensory deprivation ha- has been more recently brought into like they've done it before years ago mm-hmm. like some different investigators try to dabble with it here and there and i'm not trying to toot my own horn or anything but kind of after we started doing this i started seeing a lot of sensory deprivation stuff going on that yeah. i haven't seen in in a long time um it's which on- like i said though what's that it's on a lot of television shows right now yes it is yes, it is and and like we're a small community you know so um you know, and then we're, I'm friends with a lot of, uh, a lot of the guys on TV and girls, uh, from, from doing my show and having them on as guests and different things. And so, you know, it's, it's definitely flattering. Um, but yeah, no, so I, I hope it does. I, I hope it does change the way it is because I think that as a field, we gotta, we gotta evolve, right? We gotta try other things and we also gotta bring back some stuff that's been long forgotten. Yes. You know, that, that these people were on to something, you know, and then we kind of discarded it and started, you know, um, TV show brings out a REM pod and then that's the end of that. You know, we kind of go, sometimes we have to go back to our, our original roots. Like these, these scientists were, <clears throat> especially after the, you know, during the cold war stuff yes. and all the stuff, these guys, these weren't dummies, you know, these were, these were guys coming over from Germany, uh, did a lot of, you know, not necessarily humane testing over there because they don't have the regulations like we do um so they got to test a lot of different things and bring that knowledge here um so yeah i I would like to see some some of the older parapsychology stuff come come back around for sure well they were doing a lot of that stuff even in the states um all the way up until i think the 70s right correct the 80s um have you heard of the monroe institute for instance i've heard of it but i haven't really dove into it so they were uh robert monroe i always talk about this on on a lot of my shows um he created a program called the gateway program and essentially it's kind of like this experiment it's very similar in that he's using the binary beats to get you in that mindset to be able to do remote viewing and he was teaching this uh during the 70s to the military so that they could try to meditate and see contraband coming up out of Cuba and these different. Yes, I, I have heard of this. I just didn't know the, the gentleman's name. Mm-hmm. So, Robert. But, Monroe. Yeah, no, it's. Uh, yeah. And that's what I'm talking about. Like these types of things, they they didn't spend this kind of dedication and time and and money and efforts for something that they didn't feel was going to work. Exactly. So has this changed you at all about your beliefs in the spirit world? Yes. Um, every day I'm learning something, you know, and, and, and that's the way I am in, in everyday life too as well. But um, I would say that when I first started, I, I was very, very, very skeptical. I was like, you know, it's a coincidence. It's this, it's that, it's averages. Um, but now, 
and especially with doing this and being that Joe, um, the fellow that I was mentioning earlier uh, that's on our team is a good friend of mine prior to us joining the team. <laughs> and I know him as a person and I know him as a trustworthy person. And I'm watching him go through figuring out and learning that he is a, a medium. Um, is totally changed my mind on things and the way that and and doing this experiment and and some of the instances and experiences that I've had with him um definitely definitely changed my mind and, and made it more open to um the spiritual side of things so him as a medium for people who are sensitives and mediums and and things that are more kind of more open to the spirit world, I guess. Do you think this this can be dangerous in a way to the paranormal community? Because you see it happening more often, and maybe somebody's not as experienced, but has gifts that are so, participating in this. Um, yes, I do. And that's why I said earlier, but I didn't want to say it without um, you know, context. You know, that's why I said to be safe. You know, we only do it for this long. Um, we also have like a little rule of thumb. You know, if we as bystanders feel like it's getting um, out of control or or turning dark or, or whatever, um, that we'll stop it. And we've had we've had people get like extremely emotional, um, cry um, and, and different things as well. I do feel that. If you are not with the right people and you do it too long, that it, it can become uh, possibly dangerous. I don't know for a hundred percent because we haven't pushed the limits to it. Um, but I've actually know I've known Joe this, this, and and I've had one other person too say like I'm, I'm done and pull it off and say like I can't like it's too intense. Um, and. I haven't experienced or heard anything like this, but could it, could it possibly bring in an attachment or things like that because they're so open? Um, I guess it's possible, um, but I, I haven't experienced that. So yeah, I would say just definitely be cautious with what you're doing, just like anything else. Um, you know, people are afraid of Ouija boards, but I don't think there's any difference from a Ouija board or an audio recorder. You know, if I'm, I'm asking a spirit to communicate with me and I'm opening that, that door and that conversation, um, Right. It's on the same level in a way. I was just going to suggest maybe it is kind of like a Ouija board where you create your circle when you open it and then you shut it down. So maybe there's a process there. Yeah, we do. And we do do that. Um, you know, we say we're I'm going to. This clip um, is out there on the Internet. It was we I was closing down a session at a bar, a haunted, like just a regular bar that was having some paranormal issues. And they invited us to come in and we did a little investigation they, and they wanted to kind of host some events there to bring some people in. And we did. And I was closing a session. Joe was doing the Estes method. I'm sorry, the Delco uh, experiment. And I said, I'm closing down the, the, the session. I said, all right, I'm going to go ahead and let Joe out of this now. I want you guys to let, you know, back up. We're going to, we're going to let Joe out. We're going to say goodbye. And we don't mean, we didn't mean any disrespect. Um, you have to stay here. You can't follow any of us home. We'll come back and visit, um, but you do not have the permission to leave with any of us or anybody that is here, and we want to say goodnight. As soon as I said that, Joe, not knowing that I'm closing the session, he's just still in his days and, and talking. He goes, that's what I hate about being dead. And I just started going, what? And I started laughing, and, it was, and then I tapped him on the knee. So I guess they didn't want to be told that they couldn't come with us so that was that was pretty crazy as well but yeah no for sure we want to make sure that we close the session when we're done just like anything else kind of an off-topic question but do you guys ever help are you ever able to help a spirit move on and and and, and move, yeah and yeah so that they realize that yeah it's it's time to go yeah um me personally i i I have a little bit here and there, um, but that's, like I said, it's not my forte. It's more to, to try to capture uh, evidence. Um, so what we'll do is we'll have 
are people on the team that are more spiritual and, and know the right things to do and say, um, to do that. Yeah. Like, especially if there's, and that becomes, that's a whole other topic on its own, right? Like some of these, um, you know, I've had that question before, like, how do you feel about like going back to these, uh, these places investigating, um, with, with these spirits here and, and not helping them move on. You know, I said, that's not, I mean, I hate to say it this way, right? But that's really the, the, the owner of the property's decision, I guess. If they don't want us doing that there, um, then we're not gonna, you know, I mean, it's, it's a, it's a weird, it's a tough topic, right? It's a very weird topic. Mike? Because you want to help, you want to help. But then again, you also don't, don't want to disrespect the owners of the property either. That's true. That's very true. So what are some of the places that you've been to? I just need to ask before we're kind of running out of time, but I wanted to ask, where have you, where have you guys investigated? I mean, all, all your obvious um, spots here in Florida, anything that, you know, that's, that you can, you can drive to. <laughs> and then, you know, we've done uh, Waverly Hills. Um, I went to uh, Ledgeworth Village uh, pretty recently. The Shanley, we've done the Shanley Hotel. Um, St. Augustine Jail was a, was a really good one. Um, down in the Keys, you know, a couple places uh, down there. I saw Robert the Doll, did a little investigation there with him. What do you think um, of the building he's in? Uh, yeah, the building itself is, is, uh, is active as well. Yes. So I was down there during uh, Hurricane Dorian. They actually evacuated the island. I was in Miami and I went down to Key West to stay for probably almost two weeks. Oh, wow. Because I couldn't get back to Nashville at the time. And that was, you know, the safety route. But long story short, I got to go in there by myself um, with one other staff because there was nobody else on the island. And they let me in. I didn't really pick up on anything from the doll itself i picked up everything from the building so i just wonder if that's your experience as well yeah i i didn't get a whole lot from from the doll i did get like one possible evp phone that i when i asked to take a picture i was recording and it almost sounds like but i can't say for sure but it kind of sounds similar to go ahead um but that was really it from from him and i didn't you know sometimes i will get like a little heavy feeling on my chest you know or something if if there's something strong around, but that's about the extent of it. But yeah, in some of the other locations of of that building, uh, I definitely felt the presence, and we got some EVPs. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I, I do I do feel that that there is other parts of that building for sure that are active. What are some of the EVPs you caught from there? Oh, man, we do it so much, and there's so many. I, I would have to go back and, and look, but uh, yeah, I, there was a fort there too that I investigated. Um, was it uh, Taylor uh, Fort Zachary Taylor and that is a really neat story if you look into it real quick I hopefully I got time I'll just try to make this quick real quick so there was uh, a historian there and he was like digging and trying to find some civil war stuff from the fort and he couldn't find it and he was trying to look he started having a dream of an apparition that was coming to him in Civil War uh, attire. And after a little bit, he started to see him there, not in his dream, but actually physically when, when he was at the fort. And he walked up to him at one point and he asked him, where is this stuff that I'm looking for located? And he told him like Northwest or something like very simple like that. And that's what he heard. And he went and dug in that area and he found the cache, oh, cool. the, the, the whole cache of, of, of artillery. Um, and that's a whole story that's public, that's like published about it. But yeah, it was, that's pretty wild. So I was trying to look for, for that fella, um, the, the soldier and, uh, I did get a response. That's interesting. That's so interesting. Mike, is there anything else you want to add before we sign off? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if this is, you know, I, I mean, if you want to follow any, or, or check out any of my content that we put out there. You know, I don't mind. If, I don't know if you mind if I promote that. Is my my website? You can find Absolutely. me. Absolutely. Tell us. Tell us all about it. Tell us where to get the goggles. Where do we find you? 
So everything possible, like I'm most active on Instagram, but you can find me the easiest way by going to my website, which is FLA for Florida and then paranormal researcher, all one word dot com. So FLA paranormal researcher dot com. And that has all our uh, newest stuff and it has our links to our radio show. It has links to my YouTube with some of the clips and stuff that we talked about tonight. And uh, there's some new exciting news uh, about the drop here real soon that I can't really talk about, but hopefully uh, you'll be seeing some more of us. And the goggles are actually listed on there too. When I post them on eBay, I have a link on my website. So if you want to check them out. I'm definitely going to check out, check that out and get signed up to get one of those from you. Definitely. Yeah, for sure. You got to check it out. It's amazing. What are some of your upcoming projects like Paracons and things like that, that you can talk about? Um, right now, you know, with the holidays, and everything, I, I haven't got uh, a whole lot run down for, for this year. Um, kind of going with the flow and kind of working on this new project that we got going on. And, uh, I know we're going to be doing, um, some different investigations. We're going to be doing the Deering Estate, uh, down in Miami. We're going to be hosting some events at the Old Davy School where the uh, Beely House and the Walsh Alchester House are as well, which are both very active. Um, and uh, we, we do PEX every year, Paranormal Experience. So it's hosted by uh, Paraflix and uh, PEX. So we'll be there um, working on uh, going to Gettysburg Bash as well. So a couple. And then we every year we do the uh, World's Largest Ghost Hunt as well. So a couple different things going on and we got some other stuff in the works very exciting mike thank you for talking to me again this is mike decoro and he's here to talk about the delco experiment thanks again hey thank you very much thank you for listening to this episode of small town tales podcast while you wait for the next episode follow the show on facebook under small town tales podcast learn more about cl thomas at our website clthomas.org Small Town Tales podcast was produced by 22 Creations Multimedia, LLC.